What's up, guys, girls, young people? I hope you can put away any distractions you may have right now and really focus in on what I'm about to tell you. You know, I wish someone had sat me down when I was your age and told me what I'm about to tell you. My name is Martin. I grew up in Northeast Portland in the 80s. Although my neighborhood was rife with gangs, crime, and prostitution, my parents did everything they could to shield my three siblings and me from the chaos. My dad worked a manual labor job to support the family, and mom stayed home to take care of us kids. We received presents for every birthday, Christmases, and got new clothes at the beginning of every school year. By most standards, we were a typical working class family. Now, my dad was not an emotional man per se, but he showed his love in the quality time that he spent with us kids. We enjoyed him taking us to sporting events, participating in our little league activities as an assistant coach, attending our Cub Scout meetings, and taking my brother and me every year to chop down a Christmas tree that we would bring home for the family to decorate. Although we did not have as much as some other kids, we never felt that our needs were not being met. The love was felt, and our family was close. Academically, I fared pretty well, and I wasn't too socially awkward during my school years, although I was relatively shy. This personality trait ran in my family because my parents and siblings also dealt with it to some extent. But it didn't hinder my life until I got to high school. When I got there, it was so overwhelming for me because, like most teenagers, and you know this, is basically a death sentence if you don't have anybody to hang out with. So I immediately gravitated to other kids who actually happened to live in my neighborhood, but I had never met. Perhaps this was because my parents did everything they could to keep us from them. Nonetheless, this became my hangout crew, and like most teens, we did all sorts of things we should not have been doing. Drinking, smoking weed, skipping school, putting academics on the back burner. But my newfound independence made me feel important and invincible. So when it came to things like stealing cars, selling crack cocaine, or even carrying a handgun, I didn't shy away from it. Despite being raised to avoid all those things that I knew would not be good for my future. But at the time, I was accepted. And that's all that mattered. Initially, I began drinking to overcome my shyness and to be more sociable. But as time went on, I began to drink in isolation more and more because I was trying to mask some deep-seated insecurities that had started to manifest in my life. You see, I struggled with my identity and depression and had an overall sense of inadequacy. So instead of facing these challenges head on, it was much easier for me to drown my self-pity in a bottle of brandy. So that's what I did. I drank every morning before I went to school during my lunch breaks and after school. Alcohol was my best friend until it wasn't. After high school, my friends and I continued our criminal behavior with only two graduating. And at the ages of 18 and 19, five of us were sent to prison with sentences that ranged from five to 31 and a half years. I received a five and a half year sentence for my part in an armed robbery that I committed with them and my family was devastated. But they stuck by my side throughout that entire time and encouraged me to get my GED and to turn over a new leaf. And I wanted to make them proud. So I completed my GED, I returned to my Christian roots, and I graduated valedictorian of a boot camp program that allowed me to release early after serving three and a half years at the age of 22. So I returned home to my parents' house, I got a job at a warehouse, I attended treatment groups in the evening, and I enrolled in community college with aspirations of becoming a nurse. Life was pretty good. As time went on, however, I felt that I was missing out because at 22, everyone I knew was going to clubs every weekend, meeting women, and having fun. So it didn't take long before I began to hang out with some of my old friends who were going to clubs every weekend, thinking that I could hang out not drink, and still have a good time. But as the saying goes, if you hang out in the barbershop long enough, you will get a haircut. So before I knew it, I was clean shaven, so to speak, living my life recklessly and drinking and driving daily. 
New Year's Eve of 2003. I had been out two years. And I had been drinking and driving all day after getting off work early and partying with friends all night. And after driving like a madman all night, at 1.03 a.m., I sped through a red light, crashed into a car, killed two people, and severely injured another. I was placed under arrest and hauled downtown for processing on two counts of manslaughter in the first degree, each carrying a mandatory minimum of 10 years day for day. Three days later, I'm in my cell, and I'm just minding my own business. And I noticed someone had slid the Oregonian newspaper underneath my door, and I thought, that's strange. I didn't ask to see a paper. Nonetheless, I pick it up, and I begin to thumb through it. And I see my picture on the front page of the metro section. And with each paragraph that I read, for the first time in days, my faceless victims became people. And these people had a story. And their story was they were recovering addicts who had turned their lives around and were now helping others get clean and sober. In fact, that very night, they were returning home from a clean and sober New Year's Eve party when they were struck and killed by a drunk driver. And the columnists had talked about the irony of that. And as awe-inspiring as it was to read about these people's amazing lives, it was what came at the end of the article that changed my life forever. Quote, perhaps the person they will have ended up helping the most is the man who's charged with killing them. End quote. Now, I got to be honest with you. At the time, I'm only 24 years old, and I knew I was looking at about 20 years in prison day for day. So I couldn't fully appreciate the value in what he had just said, but I knew it was profound. So I became determined to figure out what those words were supposed to mean for my life. So for the next several months, I prayed about it. I meditated on that phrase, hearing it over and over and over in my head. And then it came to me. It didn't come from some thunderous voice from the heavens. It was not revealed in some vivid dream, but rather in the firm conviction that the only way this tragedy will not be in vain is if I carry on their legacies. If I make it my life's mission to do everything I possibly can to ensure that no one follows in the same catastrophic footsteps. So in that moment, that's exactly what I vowed to do. I arrived at state prison on January 25th, 2005. I immediately went out into the brisk air to walk around the track, surveying my new surroundings. And as I looked around, I saw some people working out, some people walking the track like me, and others engaged in other activities. And in those moments, I did a quick analysis of my life, trying to figure out how I had ended up in this same predicament again. And by the end of that hour-long walk, I had come to the conclusion that if I was going to leave prison a much different person, something from within had to change. About a minute later, I came to a very different conclusion. Changing something would not be good enough. Everything had to change. But make no mistake about it. I knew the road ahead would be difficult. The process would be challenging because it wasn't merely one bad choice that led me to prison twice, but rather a series of bad choices. Therefore, I reasoned that if I was going to finally point my life in the right direction, it'd have to start by me making a series of good choices all being strung together to create new habits that would lead to better outcomes. So with that in mind, I delved into my education, taking advantage of the community college courses that were offered at the prison. And with each class that I took, I gained a bit more confidence. And I thought maybe, just maybe, a college degree was within reach for someone even like me, someone who had never graduated high school, you see, I knew that my physical circumstances were, were not going to change. So I had to 
that despite where I was, I still had the choice to make my life count for something meaningful or to waste it. You'd be surprised how much you can accomplish when you embrace adversity and allow it to shape and mold you for the better. So in 2008, I began taking distance education courses from Louisiana State University. And in 2010, I graduated with an associate's degree from Indiana University. That same year, I began writing my autobiography. In 2013, I graduated with a bachelor's in sociology from Colorado State University. And later that year, I published my autobiography. I went on to get my master's in psychology from California Coast University in 2016. I immediately began to work on clinical hours in a substance abuse treatment program within the prison and got certified as a recovery mentor in 2018. The following year, I got certified as a substance abuse counselor. Around that same time, I had begun to tell my story about the consequences of drinking and driving at DUI victim impact panels within the prison. And I'm very proud to say that that work continues today. Now, let me be clear. I did not just chronicle those achievements to give myself a proverbial pat on the back, but rather to highlight the fact that my poor choices led to so much pain, struggle, and learning that could have been avoided had I made better choices when I was your age. My poor choices cost two beautiful people their lives, another his physical ability, and their families a lifetime of heartache. And to think it could have all been avoided had I made better choices when I was your age. Now, I would not stand here and pretend that anyone who is successful in life made all the right choices during their high school and college years. That would not be honest. What I will say, however, is that poor choices cannot be continuous. If you have found yourself on the wrong path and have clearly made some mistakes, now is your opportunity to assess your life choices and make some changes for the better before it is too late. My series of poor choices started with taking that first drink that turned into a second and then a third and then a hundredth. It started with skipping that first class that turned into several and then entire days. My series of poor choices snowballed out of control before I knew it. You see, no one thinks that taking that first drink, smoking that first blunt or skipping that first class is ever going to lead to a life of alcoholism drug addiction, not graduating high school. But ask anyone who has gone down that path how it started. I cannot tell you how many guys I was locked up with who wished every day that they could go back to their high school years and do it all over again, make better choices. Too late, but not for you guys. You still get to determine your fate you still get to make the next right choice to set yourself on a path of health, happiness, and prosperity. You know, when I reflect on my life and when things began to go wrong for me, it's clear that my need to belong and to be accepted amongst my peer group was paramount. I would do anything to fit in and to be liked, even disregarding the way that my parents raised me, doing things I knew they would clearly not approve of. It's totally understandable at your age to want to belong. We all do. But you have to ask yourself at what price? Are those you are seeking approval from headed in the right direction in their own lives? Or are they doing things that can have major consequences long term? If they are pressuring you to do things that are clearly not in your best interest, are they really your friends? You know, many psychologists say that we don't develop our smart brains until around age 25 or 26. But here's the thing. All of you know the difference between right and wrong, between good choices and bad ones. You know if something is going to be a detriment to your future or not. So I will give you the credit you deserve and say, think about the people that you're hanging around and pay attention to what they do and ask yourself if those things align with 
where you want to be in life. Because I can assure you this, the choices you make now, good or bad, will have a direct impact on where you will find yourself at ages 30 and 40. Staying in school and graduating will turn out to be the best decision you have ever made. Statistically, you will do better financially and socially if you graduate high school versus not. Also took time to think about why I have such a strong need to belong. And what I came up with is something that we all go through during adolescence, identity formation. This is something that everyone in life undergoes. We may change the way we dress or the way we talk from year to year. I remember I went from wearing baggy gangster clothes to preppy clothes in a matter of months as I was trying on new identities, trying to see which one would fit, which one I could be most comfortable in. But it also had to do with who would accept me and the identity I had to assume to gain that acceptance. And here's what I would say about that. Navigating your identity and insecurities is a very normal process. It is what you do within that process that will ultimately determine your fate. You are not alone in that process. All of your peers are right where you are. Make sure that your identity coincides with what you want out of life. Finally, use this time to really think about who you want to be and where you want to go in this life. You know, my friends and I, we never gave it much thought which is a dangerous place to be because there are far too many negative influences in this world that will pull you in many different directions. I encourage you to use the positive adults in your life to lead you in the direction that you want to go. The stakes are far too high to find yourself in a pattern of making poor choices. Just take it from me and countless others who are locked up who wish every day they could go back and do it all over again. Thank you all for your time, and I wish each of you the very best in your futures.